99.5% of what goes into these wells is basically sand and water. And um, of course, most of that obviously being water. And the fluids are not all that mysterious. In fact, uh, there's a very robust website that has been in operation now for a little over a month called Frac Focus that was actually created and is operated by state regulators under the Groundwater Protection Council and the IOGCC on which producers are beginning to post what goes into every well that's hydraulically fractured. This is a shot of the uh, actual screen, the form that you can call up. You can search this by uh, well location, by company, by uh, coordinates, by API well number, lots of different ways and find out what's in any well that's hydraulically fractured once this site uh, is fully operational and all the postings are on it. The site is also extremely good, and I'll say this to the residents in the audience and to others, because it, it actually has wonderful explanations in a very robust way about what I've talked about in terms of why we hydraulically fracture wells, how it's done, what the additives are, what they're used for, and uh, a lot of other information that I think uh, takes some of the mystery about hydraulic fracturing away. So we uh, conclude by saying that hydraulic fracturing has been, as the chairman pointed out, in use for many decades. Our first well in Oklahoma was uh, fracked in uh, March of 1949. We've done 100,000 of them. And uh, well regulated by states, frac focus is up for the fluid disclosures. Uh, and we are continually improving our industry practices and the states are continuing to work to make sure that they have the right regulatory framework for all of this. So with that, I'll conclude and I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you. You've answered many questions just by your presentation. Mr. Layton. There we go. Good morning. Very good. My name is Steve Layton, the president of ENB Natural Resources Management Corporation, and it is an honor to appear before this committee as a representative of the independent oil and gas producers operating here in the San Joaquin Valley. ENB is a California-based, privately owned independent oil and gas company. We produce approximately 7,000 barrels of oil each day and have 140 employees. Our primary objective is growth and the replacement of our reserves. It is important to note that ENB, along with many other independent oil producers, as, as Rock mentioned, reinvest virtually every single dollar and some uh, that they earn in order to replace produced reserves and hopefully grow our respective companies. This significant and ongoing reinvestment of cash flow by oil and gas companies is a vital but often overlooked part of the way this industry must manage its business in order to stay in business. This is exactly what has happened at ENB as well as many other companies in the United States over the past five to ten years uh, particularly. In 2003, ENB produced approximately 1,500 barrels of oil per day, but by reinvesting cash flow along with the financial support of our banks, we implemented a growth strategy that le uh, led by field redevelopment and acquisitions. Today, our production is in excess of 7,000 barrels of oil a day, and our employee count has grown from about 20 to 140. I would also like to mention that this production growth uh, being matched by the job growth is something that we're very proud of uh, at ENB. Today, I would like to focus on development, also known as, uh, as organic growth to some, because it is this type of production growth that is important to all of us, given the universal concerns about energy security. The industry's ability to grow production has been enhanced significantly by advances in exploration, drilling, production, and completion technology, including the, uh, the, the fracking uh, that we've uh, heard about uh, just now. Uh, but these gains, uh, as great as they are, can be offset uh, to a considerable degree by the ever-increasing burden of statutory and regulatory impediments that we face. California's and most onshore fields are very mature, having produced in some cases for more than 100 years. The easily captured, easily produced oil has already been exploited. 
For this reason, the application of new technology has been a critical part of our efforts to increase the production in these mature fields. Perhaps the greatest evolution of technology in the San Joaquin Valley involves the use of steam to heat and mobilize oil that would otherwise be almost impossible to extract. Steam has been used for over 40 years, yet the technology continues to be refined, augmented, and, imp and improved and continues to unlock large volumes of previously inaccessible reserves. More specifically, I would like to reference a small parcel that e and owns in one of the nearby heavy oil fields. Five years ago, this five-acre lease was producing just a few barrels a day. In 2007, we made an, a significant investment in the property and now have, uh, have drilled more than 20 wells and implemented a modern steam drive. With the help of new drilling, completion, and thermal technology, this little five-acre parcel is now producing almost 300 barrels a day and will produce in excess of a million barrels of oil before it is depleted. That equates to one million barrels of energy security from just five acres. In other fields, we have benefited greatly from the use of horizontal drilling to sweep uh, and, and capture large untapped areas of very mature oil producing reservoirs. The use of horizontals has given us the ability to access substantial new reserves in these old fields. One of these fields happens to be the primary driver of e &B's growth, and it is the site of a significant uh, and ongoing drilling and redevelopment program. In the 1990s, this field was on its last legs and appeared to be headed for abandonment. About five years ago, we began a redevelopment program that started with redrills and eventually new vertical wells. And with the helps, uh, help of advances in well completion uh, technology, I'll mention fracking again, and improvements in artificial lift, lift systems, our redevelopment efforts proved successful. Last year, we stepped things up a notch with the addition of a horizontal well development program. Not only now are we able to uh, access reserves that would have been uh, left behind, but after just one year, we're now generating over 10% of our production with less than 3% of our wells. We do expect this trend to continue and ultimately lead to a production rate in excess of 5,000 barrels a day. This is from a field that was almost abandoned 15 years ago. Finally, when it comes to technology, I'd like to highlight the use of 3D seismic, uh, 3D seismic imaging to, uh, to help capture untested and undrilled sands containing significant quantities of oil and gas. In our case, we've acquired 3D seismic over several hundred square miles of land uh, uh, recently, including several mature old oil and gas fields, some having produced since the early 40s and 50s. 3D seismic is usually thought of as a tool to help explore for new oil and gas fields, but it is also a very valuable tool to help hunt for untapped reserves in and around many of the tired, tired old oil fields that are all over California and many other states. It has been said by many that the best place to find oil is in an old oil field. Well, with the help of 3D seismic and numerous other technological uh, assets we have at our disposal, that statement is more true than ever. Moving on to Im the impediments. In a nutshell, just as technology unlocks new oil and gas resources for companies such as E&B to exploit, new rules and regulations and permitting delays combine to hamper that effort. While unregulated and environmentally destructive practices have no business within our industry, I would like to point out just a few examples of what I view as burdensome regulations that have directly impacted our ability to produce more oil. The first concerns federal permitting and multiple federal agencies. In our case, permits uh, necessary to proceed with one of our 3D surveys were delayed substantially uh, by the Fish, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. The first permit to conduct the survey was submitted to the Bureau of Land Management in uh, December of 2007. More than 16 months later, the required uh, biological opinion was finally issued 
by the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service. This delay paralyzed the project for almost two years. Then in early uh, 2010, we made a decision to expand the project uh, by about 30 percent, which did require a modification of the project area. Upon review, uh, the BLM, uh, in fairly short order, uh, I will say, uh, notified us that they believed the modified survey area met all criteria of the original per uh, permit and approved the plan. Unfortunately, Fish and Wildlife didn't see it that way and offered no explanation of why they disagreed with the BLM. The net result of these conflicting messages was a delay in this project for almost an additional year. That's a total of three years of delays because of these permitting issues. A second example concerns the impact of various environmental laws, more specifically the Endangered Species Act. This region has numerous threatened and endangered animals and plants. Regulations are in place that require operators to survey and determine whether any of these species would be impacted by development in new areas. This, of course, is common sense and environmentally sound. Yet these same laws apply to expansions and development within existing fields. For example, in one of our largest fields, we intend to implement a steam flood that is a directly adjacent to a very successful steam drive project operated by a larger company. To produce the steam necessary to heat the oil, we need to install a gas pipeline to fuel the steam generators. As part of the permitting process, a biological study is required, including one to determine if the blunt-nosed leopard lizard lives within the area of the pipeline. This actually requires two biological surveys, one in April and an, uh, another in October. Our concern is that this project is already in a very highly impacted area adjoining existing thermal operations. Furthermore, much of the pipeline route follows existing pipelines. Yet none of this seems to be given any consideration within the permitting process. It will be October before we can complete the survey, which could very well keep this project from being developed for over a year. Finally, I want to bring to the committee's attention an example of some pediments we, we also face on the state level. In our case, it concerns permitting delays for another steam drive project. In July 2010, we submitted an application to the California Division of Oil and Gas uh, to reactivate a previous steam drive. Ten months later, we have received, uh, we have yet to receive authorization for this multi-million dollar project, even though steam floods are currently underway in sections directly adjacent to ours. No explanation has been offered by the Division of Oil and Gas for this delay. In summary, it is without argument that the San Joaquin Valley, despite its age and regulatory challenges, holds significant additional oil and gas reserves that companies like E&B, using the latest technology, can exploit. If we can access these reserves in a timely and reasonable fashion, I have no doubt that all of the companies operating here in the Valley can, uh, can add significantly to our nation's domestic oil and gas production and will hire, train, and provide continued employment to thousands of new workers. This will without doubt improve economic growth throughout this region and more importantly will aid in the quest to provide our nation with a secure energy future. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hall. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Um, my name is Tupper Hull. I am uh, representing the Western States Petroleum Association today, um, and we're very pleased to have the opportunity to uh, address you. Uh, WISPA represents major petroleum, uh, integrated petroleum companies uh, that operate in California and uh, other Western states that, that we represent them in, as well as some of the uh, large independent producers that Rock mentioned and uh, independent refiners as well. Uh, we do think it's very important that this hearing is being held in Kern County. As others have mentioned, Kern County is responsible for producing about 72 percent of the oil that's produced in California today. And uh, California, as you know, is the third largest oil producing state in the United States. And I, I apologize for interrupting you, but I talked to the gentleman from Alaska 
And he said as Alaska declines, he'd prefer that we mention we're number two now. You, 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 you <laughs> anticipated. For a period of a couple of months earlier this year, we were number two. Now we've slipped back to number three, so I had to correct my testimony. But we're giving them a run for their money. Um, as, as others have mentioned, you know, the te technology has played such an important role in California and not just prolonging the life of, of the oil production, but in the livelihoods of the tens of thousands of men and women that work in this industry. Uh, men and women who earn really good salaries um, and bring a tremendous amount of expertise and uh, diversity to uh, this region as well as other oil producing regions in California. Um, you have asked us to talk about pathways to energy independence with a focus on hydrofracking, and I I'm going to let others here with a great deal more expertise in hydrofracking um, address that specific issue. But we don't think any discussion about um, energy independence, or we would probably say energy security, is complete without mentioning the 10.5 billion barrels of oil that the United States Geological Survey estimates is offshore of California in undiscovered but technically recoverable uh, reserves off the coast. Um, to give you some sense as to what 10.5 billion barrels would mean to California's energy security, if all of it could be produced, it would and could replace all of the oil we currently import from foreign sources for 36 years. If you just look at our largest foreign source of oil, which is Saudi Arabia, that 10.5 billion barrels, excuse me, could replace all Saudi imports for 155 years. It is a tremendous resource and one that we believe deserves consideration. Now, we're very aware of the tragic events that took place in the Gulf of Mexico last year. We spent a lot of time explaining to the media and others um, uh, our our, our view on that and why um, the uh, production that takes place in California occurs under conditions that are entirely different, very different, than what is taking place in the Gulf of Mexico in their deep water exploration. The reserves on the outer continental shelf in the Pacific are in much shallower water. The pressures typically are much less than, you find, than was found in, in the, in the uh, deep water horizon accident. And the safety equipment that is employed and the technology that's used is much more accessible on the uh, production facilities in California. Um, for the last 40 plus years, a billion barrels of oil have been produced off the California coast. And during that time, according to, and I apologize, I can't remember Bomer's in full name, it's the former MMS, um, estimated or, or has, has said that a total of 850 barrels of oil have been accidentally released into the Pacific during that 40 plus years. Now, make no mistake, that's 850 barrels too many. Our members get up every morning with a goal to ensure that not a drop of oil uh, spills in any form during their operations. But over a 40 year period, we believe that's not just a commendable safety record, but it reflects the kind of commitment and technologies that have been developed to protect the environment while providing important energy resources um, to the nation. The issue of energy security is particularly acute in California because, as we say, California is an energy island. We are not connected to other refining and producing areas of the country by pipelines. Consequently, when there are upsets in supply or international events like we're experiencing now that impact the uh, oil supplies, we, it's very difficult to shift and move supplies around to balance the markets. And so Californians pay a price um, in volatility and upward uh, pressure on prices because of this isolation. And so um, for that reason, we believe oil produced in California is the most secure source of oil for us. It is the lowest cost source of oil. And um, w we believe this conversation you're having today is the most important conversation from an energy perspective.
that we can have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimonies. Uh, as I said, this is a, a less formal environment, so uh, I don't think we're going to do five minutes. I think we're going to go around multiple rounds, uh, and I'm going a little bit in reverse order. Uh, Mr. Hall, when you said 850 barrels into a billion barrels, any guess just with the ships that come into the United States, how much was spilled in the same time offloading per billion barrels of imported oil? I wouldn't venture to guess. It's not really a, a number I'd be, uh, my members would be happy to have me carrying around and talking about. But yeah. I mean, obviously, what I would, think. Would it surprise you to know that just the stuff coming out of bilges right. uh, that we regulate far exceeds the, that? I, I don't think there's any question that the risks associated with tankerage and the volumes of oil that are coming into California every day to serve this market um, far outweigh uh, the risks of producing. Uh, here in, in the state of California and in the federal waters off the sh off co shore. Mr. Layton, I'm going to ask you a question and pretend that I'm representing the other side of the equation for a moment because I, I think it will be helpful. Isn't it true you're in an incredibly profitable industry, one in which the American people pay far more for their fuel than one would ordinarily figure it, it takes to extract and deliver it? Uh, this industry, um, without question, is experiencing uh, a, a very profitable period. I mean, you can look at the the earnings releases of the of the public companies. Um, I guess it depends on on uh, how you view it. If uh, well, let me if, give you the follow up for a second. Whenever you have a really profitable industry, one in which foreign competition is not really competition because we need them, therefore we must buy from them. It's not a question of do we buy from you or do we buy from Qatar or any other place, whether it's oil or natural gas. The fact is we have to import more than half of all we consume in oil and beginning to become a net importer in, in natural gas if we don't reverse the trend. In a sense, don't we have a world market? such as Saudi Arabia, where their lift cost is about $8. That gets it to the port for $8 a barrel. They're, we're delivering them the difference between $8 a barrel and $140 a barrel. Well, your margins, your lift cost are dramatically higher. What would you expect, for example, the lift cost of a typical Bakersfield delivery of a, of a barrel of oil to be all in? Uh, in uh, the st steam drive projects yeah. that I mentioned in my testimony, uh, we will, on a typical operation, will spend uh, 40 to $50 a barrel to extract the oil, right. uh, including the cost of steam. And, and, if you, and if you looked at the regulatory costs, or if you will, the delays, the excess that you spoke about in your testimony, how much of that is, in fact, an additional tax on this lift cost you have? Uh, it is uh, easily another 10 to 20 percent on top of our regular li uh, lifting cost. And it, it certainly depends on uh, the area. It does vary, but it is significant. Uh, the, the delay and the uncertainty, although difficult to quantify in terms of a dollar per barrel lifting cost, uh, it is uh, equally as, uh, as, as harmful as high lifting cost uh, because it doesn't allow you to plan. And in, in, in our business, uh, as I see it, stability equals security. Stability in the sense that, that we need a stable regulatory uh, and tax environment to operate in. And if we have it, we can provide additional oil production that does ultimately lead to more energy security for this, this country. Back to your question on, on the profitability, um, as I said, it depends on how you look at it. If you look at it uh, as, as, a, as a company that uh, takes those profits and puts them in a shoebox and buries it in the backyard, that's not such a good thing. But if you go to, the, uh, to, the, the, to what really is happening, and as uh, what I testified to and as Rock mentioned, uh, those profits are reinvested. That reinvestment 
leads to more energy security. And if you look at what's happened with the total production from the United States in the last few years, you're going to see a big difference uh, in the production curve. We, we're on the incline now. And, and, and I'm going to go back to that quickly. You're on the incline with a $40 cost of which probably 10 or more is produced by excesses in regulatory cost over your competitors because an $8 competitor is getting $140 a barrel because there's not enough supply. Is that a fair statement? That's what I was trying to get to in that rhetorical question, that, that in fact, if you triple your production, if America becomes close to self-sufficient, the Saudis' $140 a barrel oil, which costs them $8 a barrel, the Kuwaitis, which costs them $6 a barrel to lift, they'll have to match the market, which would certainly drop into the $60, $70. What I'm, what I'm saying, in a way, is aren't you here asking us to give you the ability to produce enough to actually reduce the price of oil and the excess profitability that exists in the world today? If, if we, as producers, are successful in, in uh, what I think is a universal quest to grow production, uh, we understand the net result uh, will be lower oil prices uh, for the rest of the country. I mean, that's, that's, that's what happens with supply and demand. If you have more supply, the price goes down, and, and we're trying to provide more supply. Well, and uh, Mr. McCarthy mentioned uh, my background in business. I, I worked a lot in engineering, but the truth is that uh, my love was economics, and there's nothing I like more than figuring out if you drop the price of, of energy and almost everything we produce and everything we do is leveraged off energy, you drop the price of everything else. So uh, thank you for your comments on that. Mr. Farenthold. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, at the risk of being inhospitable, my first question to Mr. Hull is, you mentioned California was number three, Alaska was number two in oil production, who, who, or the other way around, depending on the month. Uh, who, who, who's the solid number one there? <laughs> I, I don't seem to recall that fact, uh, Congressman. Obviously, it, it's Texas, and, and I started my career at the Houston Post back many years ago and covered the industry and found it fascinating. But uh, um, the right, gentleman's you time have, has expired. <laughs> um, well, let me visit uh, for a second, uh, Mr. Hull, about the, the your group represents. Uh, a, a wide variety of uh, companies, from the big ones to the little ones? Uh, primarily the large companies. We have a small membership of 26 companies. Um, we're not a broad-based organization. All right, so, but we're the household names in the oil and natural gas business. So if, if, if somebody were going up referring to the evil oil companies, they would probably be referring We'd to We'd be one big of oil, yes, sir. So l let me ask you. You hear about record profits within right. your industry, and you're always hearing about dollar amounts. But right. can we talk a little bit about percentage amounts within Absolutely. the industry? What, what's the typical percentage on uh, return on y'all's investment? The, the, if you, what's fascinating about the periods we go through now, because I get to handle a lot of these questions, is we never really talk about this when the prices are depressed. I think we forget that in 2008 we had a period of extraordinarily right. high crude oil prices in August. By December, crude oil was trading at $30 a barrel, and the price of gasoline came down by a comparable amount. So we think it's important to talk not only about percentages, because you're right, right. these are the largest commercial enterprises on the face of the earth the billions upon billions that are invested and required to bring this resource to market um, are, are enormous. Um, and over a period of time, when you balance out the highs and the lows, yeah, yeah, I think yeah, average. The, the natural oil and natural gas business makes about six to six and a half cents for every dollar they sell uh, yeah. of their gross sales. And, and how does that compare to other industries? Uh, about industries. A, a, a penny to a penny and a half less. So if you're an investor, manufacturing as a whole is generally more profitable than the oil and natural gas business over, over time. All right, now, and also, you're typically publicly traded companies, the, the big, the, the bigs, right? And 
the, the owners of those companies typically, what, pension funds, mutual funds, those are some of your largest shareholders? Absolutely. So pretty much probably anybody uh, in this room or watching on the web, if they have a retirement plan or own a mutual fund, are probably the owners of one of your companies. Absolutely. I don't have the f f figures right in front of me, but you're absolutely right. The vast majority of the of owners of big oil are pension funds and individual investors who have their retirement savings in, in these companies' um, ownership. Um, I, I apologize for going, just, just questioning with you. I hope we'll have another round or two so I can ask some, uh, some other people. But I wanted to visit a, a second about offshore. You talked